real estate is massive. It's a huge, it's over $200 trillion industry, by far the largest store of wealth in the world. And it has somehow missed the technological innovations that have been happening in other industries for the last few decades. And um, real estate in most countries evolved from being a commodity to an investment in the last few decades. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, even in the developed Western countries, people used to be able to afford a house pretty easily on a normal salary. But today, that's not the case anymore. It's, a, it's an investment that people look forward to owning one day. So, um, in my opinion, tokenization and fractional ownership is the biggest shift happening to the industry in a long, long time. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. Today, we have a special guest, namely Parv Prabhakar who's representing a state protocol. So without further ado, Parv, thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Parv. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Estate Protocol. Um, I largely have a crypto background. I'm a crypto native, as they say. Uh, there seems to be no consensus about how you define it, but my definition is that if you have a crypto wallet before you have a bank account, you're probably a crypto native. Um, I've been living in the space 24 seven since 2015 and in the real world asset space um, since 2021. And I started working pretty early. Uh, I put it in, I'm unsure about it because it never really felt like work. I just, kept doing, kept contributing where my interests were and um, one thing led to another and here we are. Mm -hmm. So how did you start? Was it mainly private then to begin with, I suppose, just playing around on different exchanges or, or how did you get into the entire crypto world? Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So to go back a little bit further, um, I grew up middle class in a city next to Delhi. And I had quite a few friends They were from wealthy families and uh, we would all go out, but they would have, I don't know, maybe 10 times as much money to spend than I did. So I had that motivation since um, I was, even before I was a teenager to somehow make my own money. And when I looked at the families from all these wealthy friends, I noticed that Either they made their wealth through real estate or it was stored in real estate. So I sort of had an idea that eventually I want to work with real estate at some point. But my first ever source of income was playing Zynga poker on Facebook when I was 12. And that was probably also my first interaction with digital currency. Um, with Zynga Poker, there were these um, groups on Facebook based around the game where people would post their winnings, post about strategies, um, different things they were doing. And I joined a few of these groups and I posted about uh, my screen, like the home screen of Zynga Poker. And it showed the winnings and it also showed the number of chips that I had. And back then I had no idea what's a high amount of chips, what's a low amount of chips. I just kept playing and I wanted to show off a little bit, so I posted it there. And um, I was surprised but delighted that people started offering me real money to buy my Zynga poker chips. And they, they were doing that because Zynga used to sell chips in their own game for actual money, but the price was um, 10 times as much as if you buy it from a regular person like myself. And I wanted to make that happen, but my next problem was how do I receive money from a bunch of strangers as a 12 year old with no bank account, nothing. Uh, there was no way for me to receive the money. So um, I went on a bit of a research run and that's when I first came across Bitcoin. Um, I was fascinated, but I did not start using it back then. Um, I told my mom to buy it, but who takes investment advice from our 12 year old? How was the segue from the introduction to maybe the crypto space and Bitcoin to more real estate focused? Because we'll get into the details of this in a second, but estate protocol is focused on NFTs and the intersection between NFTs and uh, real estate. So maybe from those early days, 
to what you're doing now? How was the transition there? Because to me, real estate is quite, as you also point out on your webpage, a market that's rather illiquid and that requires, um, well, in the current scenario, quite a lot of upfront investment to even get into. That's right. So um, fast forward a few years, um, I really enjoyed traveling and I'm traveling around the whole world. Um, a lot of time I'm spending in Europe, um, in Netherlands, which was my favorite country. Um, I met the editor of this um, art collective called Mama Rotterdam. And this is 2021, early 2021. So NFTs are just starting to hit the mainstream, but most people don't understand it, don't know about it yet. And I had a blog at the time where I used to write about some trading strategies I developed about other crypto things. And I showed the blog to the editor of this art collective and they asked me to write an essay explaining NFTs and what they mean for artwork, um, what, what they mean for the art industry, how they work. And during my research for the essay, it hit me that this technology is perfect for representing real estate digitally because no two houses are the same, no two properties are the same, even two apartments in the same building would be um, done up completely differently, would be valued completely differently. So um, a digital token, which was non-fungible, could not be repeated. I thought that was the best way to represent um, real estate. And that's when I started going into the rabbit hole of uh, how do you actually in practice tokenize a real asset, something like real estate. Um, and I looked at other projects that, um, that came up before the idea hit me. And I, I looked at what went wrong there, why, why they're not, still not here. And there was this one big project called Alt Estate which during the ICO days um, raised a few million dollars. And I think they never launched, but I looked at why that happened and they were using ERC-20 tokens. And back then there was zero regulatory clarity. Like now there is a little bit, still not enough for, for people to confidently go out there and execute this, but back then there was zero. People did not even know if these were securities or not. So um, those were, a few of the things I realized have changed now and NFTs are a thing and people, people understand NFTs. And so I started doing my research, starting writing the white paper and showed the white paper to a few friends in the industry. And the biggest, the most common piece of advice I got was these are securities. And this is completely different from the average cryptocurrency that people are launching. So um, you gotta be careful about the regulations. So from day one of even writing the white paper, compliance was on top of my priority list. And the real estate side of it, like I sort of always knew that real estate is something I want to work with, but I'm not an expert with real estate. So I started um, expanding the team. Um, one of my friends that I showed the white paper to got so excited about it that he wanted to work with me on building this. And he had a bunch of capital that he put up and then we went on looking for somebody that was an expert in real estate and we have a co-founder now. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can use this as a segue to shortly describe or summarize what real estate or what estate protocol is doing. So sort of the business model and also the team uh, and how long you've been uh, going on for. So maybe if you want to answer those three questions. Right. So... About the team, it's me, um, it's Ryan. He's uh, from Boston. He has a commercial real estate background. He, before this, he was the director of a publicly traded REIT. And REITs, I think, are the closest product to what we have in traditional finance. So experience with REITs is incredibly valuable for somebody attempting to do this. Um, and he's acquired for, for his REIT and for his other projects, he's acquired properties worth over 900 million. So he has a lot of experience um, researching what's a good property to acquire. And those are the skills we need to offer the best kinds of deals to, to the average person. Um, and then we have Wick, 
she's a bit of a powerhouse. She's um, she's done her PhD from Cornell, um, postdoctorate from um, Harvard. Her first job was NASA, and she's only upped her game since then. So she has an engineering background. She's the CTO. And uh, then we have VJ, who's our marketing person, social media and community person. He worked for Polygon for this and was the community manager for a co-working chain. And he studied hospitality in, um, in a university in Switzerland. What was the other question? So the other question was around the business model that you have, um, looking at it from the industry perspective, where the industry is now and the, the problem in the industry that you're trying to address. Right. Um, so we know real estate is massive. It's a huge, it's over $200 trillion industry, by far the largest store of wealth in the world. And it has somehow missed the technological innovations that have been happening in other industries for the last few decades. And um, real estate in most countries evolved from being a commodity to an investment in the last few decades. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, even in the developed Western countries, people used to be able to afford a house pretty easily on a normal salary. But today that's not the case anymore. It's, a, it's an investment that people look forward to owning one day. So, um, in my opinion, tokenization and fractional ownership is the biggest shift happening to the industry in a long, long time. Um, and as broad as the industry is, the business models have come across are equally as broad. Uh, there is so much that can happen. It's so varied that this might take a while to discuss. Um, also, this is, as you said, there's a mix between crypto and real estate. And crypto, it's global. Real estate tends to be very local. Like people generally, when they're trying to buy a property, they look around their locality. They don't look at a different country or like a different, even a different city or state. So you have in the mix of deciding on a business model, you have decisions to make about the technological stack to use, um, what standard to tokenize it on, regulatory decision, what jurisdiction to base your entity on. Um, apart from all the things that come with a, with starting a regular startup, like hiring, managing, development, all of that. So some projects have come across, they're based in, in the US, um, following US securities laws. Some are in Switzerland, where you are, some are in, in Luxembourg, some in Germany. Um, this impacts who can buy these tokens? And for example, if you're in the US and you're using regulation S exemption from registering with the SEC, first of all, you need an exemption. Otherwise you have to register prospectus with the SEC, which is incredibly expensive and time consuming and not viable for a startup. So nearly everyone is doing this, uses some sort of exemption from registering with, the, with their local financial regulator. And this impacts who can buy these tokens. In the US, if you use Reg S, then you can offer your tokens to everyone in the world apart from US people. And if you use the equivalent in the UK, for example, you can do the same, but can't offer it to UK people. There are some other exemptions you can use to um, sort of bypass these rules, but then you can only offer it to accredited investors in, in your local jurisdiction, which is, um, just rich people like in the US criteria is your net worth has to be over a million um, or you have to make over 200k a year in the last three years but anyway in terms of the tech stack um, some projects use NFTs ERC 721s um, some use ERC 20 tokens um, when these started out when I was writing the white paper to me the best token standard to use seem to be ERC-1155, which is sort of a mix between 721 and ERC-20. Um, you have non-fungible tokens that can be um, divided into smaller parts and they'd be fungible within, their, uh, within the NFT, but outside that NFT, they'd be non-fungible. 
but we then eventually moved away from it because there's not enough infrastructure in crypto supporting these tokens yet. Not enough NFT marketplaces support it, not enough decentralized exchanges support it. Uh, but in, in basic terms, the life cycle of a tokenized security is the actual tokenization itself, which is, which includes the structuring of the deal and digitization of the deal. And then you have distributing the tokens and you have to manage the investors. And then you have the post tokenization management, which is once you are done with the tokenization, once people have these tokens with them, how do you manage the day-to-day -day decisions about a property? How do you manage the corporate actions? If somebody has to make a change to the property a thousand people own, how does that happen? And then you have secondary trading. Um, once people own these tokens, ideally they want to be able to sell these tokens to someone else or back to you. They want to be able to get out of the deals. So you have secondary markets and on all of these different areas, there are projects um, innovating and, and solving these problems in different ways. So some projects have come across, they focus on residential real estate uh, in the US, for example. Some like us, they focus on commercial real estate. We do that because um, most people, the average person, does not have access to commercial real, real estate assets. For residential, most people can get a mortgage um, and buy the property that way. But for commercial, the average person does not even consider it because the barrier to entry is so high that it's usually only either funds or, or very rich people that consider commercial real estate assets. I've even seen a project that has a sort of an ETF based on neighborhoods um, in popular cities. So for example, you'd be able to buy a small part of Knightsbridge in London or Manhattan in, in New York, which I think is pretty cool, but um, I'm not sure how much demand there is for speculating on neighborhoods yet. I think eventually this would be a popular, um, popular way, popular way to speculate within crypto. If we compare a little bit the governance model that you are suggesting now to maybe RITs, like you mentioned before, if you compare those two products, what would you say are the main differences now um, compared to what currently exists in, in the industry? Right. So the governance is interesting. Um, that is the post tokenization management that I talked about. Um, with real estate, there are companies tokenizing other real world assets, which are a lot easier to manage like US treasuries and all of that. But with real estate, since there is an actual property that needs to be managed on the ground, this is an important part of the whole equation for any business model. Um, some companies structure it in a sort of like a DAO where people vote on every little decision for a property. So if the walls have to be repainted, they would have to, there would have to be a vote conducted. If the tenant has to be changed, there would have to be a vote. Um, if the property has to be sold, there would need to be a vote. Some other projects do it in a GP LP structure where there is either a firm or an individual that is responsible for managing the property on the ground. And then the people buying these tokens act as LPs, as liquidity providers who are um, putting their money in, they get the dividends, the returns from the property, but they're not actively involved in the day-to-day -day actions. Um, the decision there is sort of between efficiency versus control. And I think for different audiences, different types of um, structures make sense. For um, if your audience, for example, is somebody that knows what they're doing, they have experience with real estate managing properties, then the control might be a better option to give them um, because you can expect that the voting process would ideally result in a, in a positive outcome. But if your um, audience is the average person who's buying, a, let's say, $50 worth of a, of a piece of a property, and they've never done this before, they don't know um, the ins and outs of managing a property. Somebody like me, for example, if I were to do this, I have no idea how, 
how it is to manage a property on the ground, a commercial property in the US. So I would prefer if somebody did that and took care of that and that is not a problem that I had to deal with. So for somebody like that, if your audience is like that, then a GPLP structure makes more sense. So we're back after some minor technical issues now. Um, and we were talking about GPLP structures before we had these technical issues. So maybe if we resume the conversation there. Um, so what is currently the setup for a state protocol when it comes to these structures and what are you aiming to, well, what system are you aiming to put in place for the governance? So um, at the start, the structure that we are going to choose is the GPLB structure. Um, since we're dealing with commercial real estate, these are assets that tend to be really high value. So an office building, for example, that would be millions of dollars in, in, the, in major cities in the US. And till the time that we have an audience that can fund the whole property, um, it has to be a small fraction of a commercial real estate. So in the protocol, we have a system where if it's a small asset, then we have limits on how much one person can own it in order to prevent them from um, controlling the asset in a malicious way. But if it's a large asset, and if the, um, if the ownership is already set up in a way which aligns incentives, then we don't have a limit on how much one person can own in the deal. So for example, the GP, owns 20% of the property and we're tokenizing 5% of it, then we can be, um, we can rest easy knowing that the GP is going to take decisions which are um, in favor of the property because he also owns the 20% of it. Um, for, but if it's a small asset, like a, let's say a $200,000 house, then uh, there's a limit on one person owning um, 10% of it, 10% is the limit. So you can't own more than 10%, um, even if you buy all of these tokens. That is our structure. Some, I've seen some projects use a different structure with no limits. Some, I've seen some use um, just a DAO-like structure where people vote on every little decision. That is good in terms of control, but not great in terms of efficiency. And that leads to a direct monetary loss so one thing that strikes my mind when it comes to um, this kind of technology and this way of selling stakes essentially in, um, well, in real estate is if you look at the crypto space as a whole, there's been a lot of sort of fraudulent activities when it comes to hyping up the values of, for example, uh, new coins. Um, when it comes to real estate, I see a potential problem in a similar way. So let's say you have... Um, real estate where there's a for, um, well, the GP in this case to hype up the, the value of that uh, real estate, how would the structure that you're putting in place hedge against those kinds of activities? That's a good question. And it is a problem that we've thought about for a long time. Um, there is, so the demand side of this equation in this marketplace is a lot easier to solve than the supply side, surprisingly. Um, my my co-founder, my real estate co-founder likes to say, why would a property owner go through the brain damage of understanding tokenization and, and jumping all these logical fences to sell these tokens to a bunch of people in different countries when they could just sell it to their local um, property dealer or wherever? Uh, the answer is that for most of them, either they believe that they can sell the same property for a higher price if they're selling it to a thousand people um, or it's a property that is not selling in the local marketplace so it's an undesirable property and both of these situations are not great news for the buyer the customer uh, there is another way out another approach so in the us and in a lot of other countries there are already a lot of crowdfunding platforms for real estate but they are built on fiat rails and they only allow, most of them, they only allow accredited investors in the US. And these people are the ones that can own the property outright. Like if, you, if your net worth is over a million dollars, you can probably buy a property in general. So uh, there is still a mismatch between 
what people need and what exists. But in terms of supply, there are these crowdfunding platforms that we partner with, and they they already they've been doing this uh, acquisition of the properties and this whole business for many years now. It's the oldest platform is probably older than a decade, and they have they run a very well oiled machine in terms of acquiring the properties, selecting the best deals, and they only they also only fractionalize a small part of it in, for crowdfunding. And most of it is owned by larger investors and the GPs, the people that offer these crowdfunding deals, which means that incentives are aligned. Um, they're not selling 100% of the property, so they can't really hype up the value and uh, make any extra money there. And since uh, their main audience is accredited investors in the U.S., they are they're usually sophisticated financial market participants and they're uh, pretty good at valuing the properties independently so you can't really with crypto for the tokens are not securities the audience is retail and retail is not great at valuing the property so you can hype up the valuation and play all kinds of games but when the main audience is accredited investors um they tend to be more sophisticated and it's it's not impossible still but it's a lot harder to hype up values or mess around monkey with the deals. Mm-hmm. And it's mainly accredited investors that you're targeting with this platform as well, or are you looking to like, is the vision, so to speak, to open that up for the general public as well? We are focusing on the general public since day one. Accredited investors can buy it, but the focus is the, the average person. And even the average person, um, so our idea is to try and find the path with least resistance. Um, the average person in a in a rich, developed country, Western Europe or the US, for example, they find some value in this, but not as much as the average person in a country like Argentina or Turkey um, or recently in Nigeria, places where the fiat system is so mismanaged by the government that people have no no choice but to use other countries' financial resources. So um, stable coins are a very interesting topic to study when you talk about this stuff because stable coins are the, by far the biggest and most widely accepted use case in crypto. And stable coins, when you think about it, are real world assets which are represented digitally. Stable coins are US dollar, which is a real world asset, but they're the digital representation of it. So if you look at what places have high rates of adoption for stable coins, at the top of the list are places that have really high inflation, uh, the places that have mismanaged financial systems, um, Venezuela, Argentina, Turkey, uh, um, other countries in Latin America, Brazil and all that. With Venezuela, they're also under a bunch of heavy sanctions, so we can't help much there. But our focus is going to be um, on the retail population in places like Argentina and Turkey. And the reason for that is that they already have the highest um, percentage of stablecoin users. Over 30% of people in Argentina use stablecoins in their day-to-day transactions. So they're used to it. They're used to the technology. Um, they're used to the method of exchange between the tokens that we offer and the crypto economy. And they need this the most. So they've already shown the affinity towards um, owning real world assets, <clears throat> sorry, in a digital form by using stablecoins so much. And once you have a bunch of cash, you're still susceptible to inflation. Just is just the U.S. Fed's inflation. Like if the U.S. Fed prints more money, you're still losing real value. Um, it's just not as fast as you losing a value in your local currency like Argentina pesos. So when people hold and own a bunch of these stable coins, the next step for them is how do you invest this money? Where do you invest this money in a safe, stable way? And they're looking for stability, even though they use crypto, they're looking for stability because their the traditional financial system that they're part of is already more volatile than crypto. So volatility, speculation is not of the highest interest to them. It's stability and stable yields. So for them, 
and to be able to solve problems for those people um that's where our go to market strategy and and all the business model decisions that we're making are based so we we find the group that needs it the most in the whole world and for our business model all these different decisions that you have to make the trade offs that you have to do we find the people that need this the most and then work our way backwards from there what would work best for them what do they need the most what they want the most that's how we make these decisions i have a number of follow up questions but maybe to make it more clear first how far along are you in terms of the uh, of bringing your solution to market um and then we can go into more perhaps uh, regarding the stable coins and, and sort of that whole adoption um but first i think it would make sense to briefly discuss how far along you are in, in the adoption process so we've been working on this for over 2 years now and there is a lot of technical challenges to be solved a lot of um regulatory challenges to be solved in the legal structure and we are aiming high with this like we want to we want to make sure that legally even in case that we go out of business um uh, people still maintain the rights to to ownership for these properties that is um a little more challenging to do than um just start a business do a pilot there so it's been 2 years since we've been we've been working on this and we are about 3 to 4 months away from launching the first deal so pretty far along but uh a little while to go for the launch mm-hmm. and where is that going to be launched and do you already have well either if you have some form of property or if you're affiliated with uh property owners we do have a few deals to choose from and then the main target area as you said it would be latin america um to begin with and if you talk about maybe the the coins that are being used there so you were referring to stable coins before i assume that would be the the main mode of purchase so to speak um that stable coins rather than any other currencies when it comes to investing in in your tokens um but then also have a selection process when it comes to what kinds of stable coins you accept because there are a few different kinds um so maybe some more details on that um so it has to be stable coins and not one of the volatile crypto because there is a staking process in between where if the the property or the deal that we're offering is not 100% funded then the smart contract for this um for the fundraise would automatically refund everyone's money and the amount of time the contract stays up would be decided by the seller but it could be anywhere between one day to a month or even longer so there is going to be crypto is going to be in that contract for a little while and if the coins that we use are not stable then then after that one month or something the the well amount of money that people put in the contract can be reduced by half or the value of the property that we're offering can be up or down that's not the ideal way to do this so it's only going to be stable coins that we accept the types of stable coins um first off it's going to be USDT USDC the two most popular ones um in latin america surprisingly USDT is more popular than USDC even though you'd consider USDC to be technically to be more um resilient or or secure um usdt is a euro dollar coin which means it's a stable coin backed by us dollars but these dollars are held in bank accounts outside the us so they're not in, in the us fed's control usdc their reserves are held inside the us so um they do have an ultimate backstop in case every bank in the us fails all everything fails everything collapses usdc's reserves those dollars um uh, would still be backstopped by the federal reserve in the US but if the same thing happens outside the US for USDT um the the banks where they have the reserve if they collapse there is no backstop in that case so USDC is a little more secure but USDT is a little more popular in Latin America so we got to use both of them and then we have some interesting partnerships in the mix where um stablecoin issuers from these local economies like there are stablecoins for argentina argentinian peso turkish lira and uh, brazilian real other countries are building their own so 
as long as we have a system where we can manage the volatility and convert the money into um, the the issuer's local currency. So if the property is in the U.S., then we want the issuer to receive U.S. dollar stable coins. As long as we can have that system in place, we can accept stable coins from, from other countries also. And we are working in partnerships to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And what are the conversion timelines, roughly speaking? So let's say you, you receive a, a large amount of a stable coin. What do you expect that uh, time discrepancy between you receiving the stable coins and until you've actually converted that money to the local currency? Because you're also at a risk there uh, if you hold the coins for long. I mean, I know these are stable coins, but let's say they're stable coins against another currency. Like you said, you would still have an FX risk in place. Um, but I mean, even more so also historically, some different stable coins, if you take like algorithmically um, supported ones, uh, have not always worked out. Um, so there's also the inherent risk, even if it's called a stable coin, of holding the asset. Yeah, that's, um, that's one of the risks you have to account for. Um, one of the partners we're working with, they have a system that converts it instantly. And that is ideal for us because somebody sends, for example, the Brazil, Brazilian real um, into the contract to uh, our partner exchange, Sabergon Issuer. They would instantly convert that into USDC. USDC is ideally our top preference for what we would ideally want to receive. So they would receive from their customers the local stable coin. They would convert it into USDC instantly. And then us and our seller, the property seller, they would receive USDC. But there might be other, like the other um, issuers in other countries, their systems might lag a little bit more um, it is a risk we have to manage for every single country individually. Okay. And then the um, real estate that you would actually invest in, given that you're launching in Latin America, would also be local properties or would it be um, sort of cross-continental that you would have people in, in South America investing in Europe, for example? What's the at least initial plan when it comes to rolling out? It's going to be transcontinental that is also one of the biggest ways we differentiate ourselves from all the other people trying to do this um we want to create links between countries international links so if a country's default financial system is unstable and the people there need more stability in their lives then we want to connect them to the financial system in countries that are more stable and um not everyone is always looking for stability. Like a lot of people in stable countries are looking for volatility to, to take a lot of risk, try and make a lot of money. Eventually we would want to add options for them to have properties in volatile countries or developing countries where yields are low, but potential for price increases are a lot higher. But the first set of links that you want to make are buyers in um, countries that have unstable financial systems and properties in stable countries. So first one is certainly going to be in the U.S. Um, from after the first few, we're going to look at Europe, Western Europe, um, UAE. That is pretty popular. But the first little set of properties that we offer are going to be in um, stable economies. And then you would have, so let's... Uh take the particular example, you have a a property in the US and then you have an investor in, I don't know, Argentina, let's say. When it comes to the legal interaction or the the legal system, how that interacts with this kind of purchase, um, would you have to account for where the purchaser is is located? Or is that solely based on US legislation because you have a property in the US? Um, So for us, and for this stage of the industry, um, it's we'd be concerned with the law um, in the country that our legal entity is based in. So if us, EP, the issuer, is based in the U.S., then we have to follow U.S. securities laws. And I suppose eventually, if this does get popular, like crypto, um, every country would come up with their own laws about who can offer these tokens to their citizens. But right now, no country has a law about that. Um, So even if we want to follow local laws, it's not possible. There are no laws about it. So we are concerned with um, laws of the country that we are based in. Yeah, perfect. And what do you think is holding back, let's say, the industry at this point? So 
I've seen a number of uh, tokenization, let's say, projects uh, online, and neither of them, as far as I've been able to tell, have taken off in a large scale yet. Um, in terms of the, the hurdles that you see for the industry and what needs to be overcome to make this really a mainstream product, what do you think are the, are the main ones? Um, so the first one that comes to mind is regulation again. Um, <clears throat> very re recently, has there been regulatory, a little bit of regulatory clarity about this even being possible? Like only in 2018, um, Delaware was the first jurisdiction to come out with a blockchain law that let people issue shares of a company on the blockchain. So when you think about how this happens legally, a property is held under a company, an SPV, a special purpose acquisition company, and shares in that company is what is actually being tokenized and people actually are, own, um, are able to purchase shares of a company and that company in turn owns the property. So indirectly, people own the property, but it's only possible because the jurisdiction of Delaware, now there are others, but Delaware started it. Um, let people issue shares of a Delaware um, LLC or C-Corp on the blockchain. So regulation, regulatory problems are being solved, but most people are still um, more concerned with those. And real estate, like we talked about, is, a, is an industry where most participants are very risk averse. Um, the sellers, the buyers, everyone looks at it as a stable, safe, secure um, industry, which is makes perfect sense. But that has meant that the industry has avoided um, innovation for quite a while. So um, regulatory clarity, I think the first challenge, UK, UK's um, jurisdiction task force recently came out with a statement about tokenizing real world assets and the, the legal structures under British common law that can be used. And that statement was received pretty well. Um, I, I suppose a lot of projects are gonna to move to the UK to do this. I think UK is the jurisdiction that has the highest regulatory clarity for this for now. The other big challenge is that for an age old industry where most participants are risk averse, you're taking that industry and mixing it with crypto. Crypto is an industry where most people are degenerates. They are um, super risk tolerant, maybe even the most risk tolerant mainstream industry in the world. And this industry moves so quickly that one year in crypto feels like 10 years in any other technological industry. So um, combining the two extremes of risk tolerance and speed of development, that has been, in my opinion, the biggest challenge people have faced. And that's why to start the network effects, you need one group of people that absolutely love what you're offering. And they're gonna stick around with you even when you iterate and do experimentations with other uh, products, other services. Um, that's how you start network effects. And finding that group of people has been, in my opinion, the biggest challenge for all these people. And we believe that that group of people is um, stablecoin holders in heavily inflation affected countries like Turkey and Argentina. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see that we're almost running up on time. I have a, a couple of more questions I would like to ask. And the first one of those would be, let's say you're now then a local investor in South America looking to invest in uh, property based in the US. Uh, when it comes to the security question again, or um, how you can gain assurance that the property you're buying into is um, valid and actually worth the price that is stipulated for. What would be your most compelling argument for um, anyone looking to invest in, in a situation like that? Right. So uh, we do want to follow crypto's ethos, even when, you come, when we take it to real estate. So we have a partnership with Chainlink um, and we're also looking at other third-party data providers where Chainlink has this node that provides data about the price per square feet um, of real estate in every single zip code in the US. There is this company called Prospect Now that delivers this data through Chainlink and it gets delivered in a decentralized way. So people, if they want, they can check the average selling price of the specific zip code where the property is in 
for the last 20 years, for every deal that's happened in that zip code for the last 20 years. And that is uh, one of the ways that people can verify the pricing data. Um, we ourselves have uh, very high standards for the data that we provide to uh, people that are buying these properties. And I see new projects coming up with data solutions specifically for um, crypto real estate fractionalization projects. Like there's this one called BHR. Um, we might want to explore a partnership with them. But yeah, like we want to provide them as much data as we can from from us and then also have sources of third party data from for verifying that verifying the the basics of of that data like the pricing and the basic stuff like what you find on zillow so looking forward as well we're still in the early parts of 2023 um looking at this year as a whole what would you consider to be a successful year for a state protocol and what are you looking to achieve during this upcoming year um a successful launch and tokenizing properties worth a million dollars that's the goal for this year it's not compared to the rest of the goals that we have it's pretty realistic not super ambitious but for at the start we do want to be realistic hit the goals that we set and um, then go on from there in the midterm the plan is to make this economy this this digital representation of real world assets economy as efficient as possible um and in the midterm we are also going to enable people to borrow and lend based on these tokens these tokens would be used as collateral and then people would be able to borrow and lend um stable coins based on these and then like i said also add options for different kinds of international connections so if we have a large audience from stable economies countries they might be more interested in investing in real estate in very quickly developing countries like india or some place in africa for example where the real estate prices um if there is no major problem in the economy real estate prices double every few years uh but the yields are pretty low there so it's a different kind of trade off which is more suitable to a different kind of person uh there are other such connections to be made but eventually we will have a well organized categorically sorted out marketplace uh like a zillow or amazon for real estate where you can also buy parts of of what you see on there mm mm-hmm. perfect <clears throat> And for people that want to get in touch with you, um, what would be the easiest way to to do that? You can talk to me on my Twitter, on EP's Twitter, on my email, which is parv at estateprotocol dot com, and my Twitter at is parv crypto. And before we close, is there anything you would like to maybe highlight as a final note? Um, just the this is. in a very hard challenge that we picked up and other people are trying to do the same thing so to them my message would be that this is a big tough problem like a big heavy problem and there might be there probably are a lot of challenges in getting to the goal that we all have but this is incredibly rewarding work um in a certain sense this lowers the intensity of global borders that we have the fiat system creates um invisible borders that we will have a hard time getting over but if we can manage to do this if we can manage to execute this in the way we envision then um i think it will lead to a better happier world perfect so with that I would thank you very much Parv for joining this interview and uh, to have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you Nicholas.